This video is sponsored by Masterworks. As we know, Europe had its industrial revolution in the middle to late 18th century. But 500 years before that, another country was on the cusp of reaching industrialization itself. Since the thumbnail is pretty much a dead giveaway, yep, that country is China. To be more specific, it is China during the Song Dynasty. And on this episode, I will talk about the artistic and scientific development of this period and how an empire administered by a gaggle of nerdy scholar officials managed to achieve near industrialization 500 years before Europe and became the richest country in the world. The Song Dynasty is quite a contentious period. This is where the Chinese cultural narrative diverged from the historical reality. Among some armchair nationalists, it is often seen as a weak and pathetic dynasty. It constantly lost wars, got pushed around by its northern neighbors, and China was at its one of its smallest size in history. In many of the literary works set in this dynasty, such as Yang's Family Generals, Water Margin, and Legend of General Yue Fei, the court is commonly depicted to be swamped by corruption, ineptitude, and treasonous officials. But they made the vital mistake of overlooking the various artistic achievements and technological advancements of the dynasty, which made China the richest country in the world, at least during the northern Song half of the period. Back then, its GDP was comparable to contemporary Europe, and its GDP per capita was estimated to be higher than Britain and Spain in the similar period. It's only lower than Italy's. So, how did this unprecedented development happen? Well, there are many causes to this phenomenon, but one of the main ones was probably the focus shift from the promotion of military generals to scholar bureaucrats. Obviously, this is going to bite them in the derriere later, when the jocks from the northern nomadic empires rode down to crush these noodle-armed nerds. But for a while, this policy actually worked to their advantage. Virtually any time a new dynasty was established in China, the new dynasty do their best to avoid the mistake of the previous, oftentimes to the extent of overcorrection. The later Zhou dynasties that came before them, and even the Song dynasty itself, rose to power when a rogue general usurped the weak emperor. So the shift could partly be an attempt to weaken the military factions. Additionally, the second emperor of Song dynasty felt inferior to his more militarily accomplished brother who founded the dynasty, so he wanted to leave his mark in history by focusing on civil affairs instead. But they didn't just hire bookworms willy-nilly off the street. They had to pass the imperial examination first. And the exams of this period was quite different to the dynasties before and after it. Unlike the previous dynasties, it was open to almost every adult male with the exceptions of criminals, monks, and some lowly tradesmen and craftsmen. So there is a much larger pool of talents competing for imperial appointments. And unlike the dynasties that came after it, it had not yet disproportionately focused on the Confucian Four Books and Five Classics. Because the Neo-Confucian Zuzi, who turned the Four Confucian books into the core curriculum, was only born in the second half of the Song Dynasty and its implementation into the examination only started in later dynasties. This also means that poetry, arithmetics, and other subjects were still tested in the imperial exams, and this produced a crop of the best officials with diverse sets of skills and talents, including the arts. Poetry, painting, and the other arts reached new heights during the Song Dynasty because the best minds of the empire were incentivized to study it with the promise of officialdom. And between the two halves of the Song Dynasty, we can see the thematic trend change according to the political reality of the period. The Northern Song Dynasty officials often depicted huge sweeping landscapes, whereas those from the Southern Song often depicted closer and more intimate scenes with little to no background due to the Neo-Confucian's inward-looking philosophy. One such example of this painting is Li Song's Riders on Donkey Back. It fetched a price of 675000 at auction back in 2020. Yep, all that just for a painting of a mundane game of donkey polo. But why does it worth so much? Simple, 
historical and cultural value meets the law of supply and demand. It is not like they're making any more art from Song Dynasty, you know. But what if you could harness this demand to your benefit without needing $675,000? Masterworks, a revolutionary fintech platform, had that same question. So they did something about it. They figured out a way to make legendary works of art available to everyday people like us by enabling you to invest in just a portion of works that you find desirable. That's why they have over 500 million in assets and over 400,000 users on the platform. And you, my subscribers, can get priority access to skip their waitlist simply by clicking on the link in the description. Anyway, let's get back to the Imperial exams. As I've previously said, the exams during the Song Dynasty was greatly expanded. It also provided a relatively viable avenue for the commoners to climb the social ladder. In Tang Dynasty, only about 15% of the officials were made up of graduates. But in the Northern Song Dynasty, 40% were graduates. And among the graduates, 57% of them did not even have a father, grandfather, or great-grandfather with official ranks. But of course, the competition was a nightmare. By the middle of the 12th century, there were roughly 100,000 candidates registered for the annual prefectural examination, and in the middle of the 13th century, there would be 400,000. Yet, only about 3 to 1% of them became graduates. So that created a massive demand for education and books. And you know as they say, Necessity is the mother of invention. Thus, the movable type was invented by Bi Seng sometime in the 1040s. His movable type was made of wood, and over the centuries, other innovators would develop clay and metal movable types until Johannes Gutenberg invented the European printing press 400 years after Bi Seng's invention of movable type. Woodblock printing had existed in China since at least the Han Dynasty and used to print documents since the Tang Dynasty. But the movable type just made the process much more efficient, even if it didn't completely replace it. Besides the cultivation of talented officials, the Song government also rewarded innovations since the year 970. When the Weapons Manufacturing Bureau developed a new type of gunpowder arrow, they were richly rewarded. And even anyone who were not directly related to the government would be rewarded for the invention of new weaponry. These innovations were then disseminated throughout the empire. If you are interested in the developments of early gunpowder weaponry in China, you can check out a previous episode when I covered that topic. This central directive for the dissemination of new technology was not just limited to weaponry. It included shipbuilding, iron refinery, and even agriculture. That's how the Champa rice, which was sent from China as a tribute from the Kingdom of Champa, located in southern Vietnam today, was spread throughout China by imperial directive. This type of rice can be harvested twice per growing season, and it helps sustain the explosive growth of China's population from 50 million to 100 million in the 11th century. The combination of these policies eventually produced some of the highest achieving men in Chinese history. Coincidentally, they also served the Song Dynasty court at the same period. Imagine if Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, and Shakespeare worked in the same office. Su Song, the astronomer, artist, poet, engineer, polymath, built what was likely to be the most advanced water-driven astronomical clock tower of the contemporary world. Sun Kuo, the scientist, geographer, and musician innovated the compass to be made more practical for navigation 400 years before Europe, and also discovered the true north. He also wrote a series of essays called Dream Pool Essays, including the technologies of the period, such as Bi Seng's movable type. Su Si, or more popularly known as Su Dong Po, was an essayist, artist, and a household name in China up to today as one of its greatest poets. He's also got a pork dish named after him, which is ironic since he advocated for vegetarianism. Sima Guang, the historian who wrote the massive historical chronicle covering over 1,300 years of Chinese history, Zi Zi Tongjian was also there. Last but not least was Wang Anzi, economist, poet, and political reformer best known for pushing the implementation of the well-intentioned new policies. 
which according to some historians was to blame for the decline of the dynasty. When Wang Anshi was pushing this reform during the reign of Emperor Shen Zhong in the later half of the 11th century, the court at the time was divided between two camps. The reformers led by Wang Anshi and supported by other officials such as Shen Kuo, and the conservatives led by Sima Guang and supported by Su Dongpo among others. As for Su Song, he just kept himself out of the whole kerfuffle. Wang Anshi wanted to alleviate the suffering among the peasantry, cut out government expenditure, and bolster border defense. Because by that time, the empire was in a precarious position. Not only that it had to contend with the Kitan Liao dynasty, they also had another challenger in the form of the Tangut Western Xia. So poetry should really be cut out of the examination, he thought. With a lot of difficulties, his policies were finally pushed through. But despite having the right intention, the implementation was a disaster. Not long after, in 1127, despite all the technological advancements and the state-of-the-art and gunpowder weaponry, Song Dynasty's feeble military was defeated by the newly risen Jurchen Jing Dynasty, and its northern territories were taken. While the dynasty survived, the innovative juice of the northern Song Dynasty seemed to have ran out. The innovations of the Southern Song paled in comparison to Northern Song. Well, education and promoting technology is fine and all, but if you can't defend your country, then you are just enjoying your prosperity at a borrowed time. Alright, that's it for the episode. Anyway, if you like this kind of cool history, then subscribe because we've got plenty more to come. Before I go, I would like to thank my Patreon supporters for helping to make these videos possible. Until next time, Stay cool, my bros.